Hello, everyone. Welcome to our next session. Java, life is short. And I agree, Kevin. My name is Roel Hotsmans. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today's session, Kevin Dubois, as you can see. Not only is Kevin a great idea guy with a lot of energy, and I loved that I had the privilege to uh, mentor him for a small uh, period for to make him even better than he is today. Um, he's been a great developer advocate within Red Hat for a while now. Uh, he's even a principal developer advocate. Well done, Kevin. Um, and he has a great mission to supercharge the developer joy. Let's be honest, we all want that, right? And he uses open source as his guided light. Follow him at Twitter via Kevin Dubois. It's easy to find, so it should be easy. And it's also a way to ask questions. Um, obviously, if you have any questions during the session, please submit them in the chat window. If possible, we'll address them during the session. If not, then absolutely, we will be able to uh, find your questions and share the answers with you directly after the session as well. As we've said in the previous session, a recording of this and actually all sessions will be hosted on the Developer Advocates um, uh, and the Reddit Developer um, YouTube so that you can easily see them at a later date. We also encourage you to join us during the live chat, during the break on the main stages or for live dialogue with fellow Red Hatters that are here to support you to have a wonderful time. With that, let me turn things over to Kevin. Kevin, please take it away. Thank you, Rul. All right, so uh, welcome to the session. Like Rul said, uh, Java Life is Short, which is all about uh, productivity and developer joy with open source. So basically, I'm going to go through um, a couple different tools and uh, solutions that uh, that I found and you know that make me a little bit more productive uh, with with Java. So uh, that's the idea of the session. So a little disclaimer. Um, of course, it's an opinionated talk because there's you know a lot of tools out there. There's a lot of different ways you can make yourself more productive and have fun uh, developing with Java. So I'm just gonna you know kind of pick and choose a few things uh, that I think are, are really cool. Um, so this is of course my personal experience and, and recommendation. But so you know don't yell at me if your tool uh, isn't getting highlighted. You know because I can't do it all, of course. Um, and you'll see. Quite a bit of Quarkus in this session too, because you know that's uh, my favorite uh, Java stack these days, and it does really make me more uh, productive. So, but we'll get right into it. So, at the base, you know, if you get started with Java, you've probably seen this at some point uh, in your career, or if you're a student, maybe you've uh, come across this pretty recently. But you know, so the typical hel "Hello World" class uh, with with Java, right? This is the way to get started to just show "Hello World," and it's kind of a lot, right? So because you have to know what is a class, why is it public, why you know why do you need these uh, methods in there with also public or private, protected? What's the difference between those? Then you have to know what uh, static method is. Um, what is this void thing? It's a return type. Well, in this case, there's no return, but you have to know all that. And then there's this uh, arguments, and well, it's not even used in this case. So it's you know very confusing, and, and it's a lot. Once you learn a little bit more about Java, you get used to this, but and, and you probably never write this again, right? Because there's uh, stacks and frameworks and everything to make your life a little bit easier. But you know when you get started with Java, typically or often this is the case. Now the Java world itself is doing uh, some work as uh, some projects like Project Amber. That uh, that are going to make this a little bit simpler and everything, but you know, right now this is kind of the, the way to get started. And then uh, you would have to do, uh, you know, compile your uh, your code, and then finally you can run it to get your hello world. So you you know, there's a lot going on to just get your hello world. Whereas in other languages, it's it's quite a bit faster and easier. So um, one tool that I think helps with that, you know, to get started. Um, but also to write simple uh, scripts with Java um, in the CLI, even that you know maybe typically you would use you know Bash or or Python or something. Actually, you know you can use uh, Java and JBang uh, to do that pretty well. So um, JBang to get started with it, you know you do something like JBang init, and then you give a name for your file, which will also then turn out to be your class. And then uh, you just run it, so jbang main.java. And actually, if you don't have Java installed, it'll even install Java for you. So 
you know, let's uh, let's take a look at that real quick. So uh, I'll go to my terminal here, and uh, we'll do that right. So jbang init, and then uh, hello devnation.java, and uh, I'll start that. And now you can see that jbang has created this file for me. Uh, hello devnation, and uh, you can see basically the same thing, right? So hello world. Um, with pretty much what I showed in the previous example. And then you can see this uh, comment here, um, which is kind of handy because it, it uh, helps interpret this file. So I can just run it uh, without actually doing jbang, even though I could, right? I can do jbang devnation.java. Uh, oh, it's hello nation.java. And then we can run it and it shows hello world, or we can just do, you know, uh, dot slash for the file name. Oh, Jello. <laughs> That's a fun one. Hello, DevNation. Same same thing. So we can get it started pretty easily. So you can use JBang um, for a simple script. So of course, I could put some more uh, stuff in there. But you can actually also create CLI scripts pretty easily. So you can do kind of uh, similar things. So you can do JBang init, and you can use these templates. And so one of the templates that you use with uh, JBang is CLI. So you can do JBang init, uh, template CLI, and then um, I'll call my class CLI.java. <clears throat> and then um, we can see again, CLI.java. And in this case, we actually have some more stuff in this file, right? So we have this uh, comment depths. So actually you can add dependencies, libraries to JBang scripts kind of uh, in this way, which means that you don't need to immediately learn uh, or use um, uh, Maven or Gradle or something, and then you know, kind of build with uh, with those build tools. Those are great, but you know, for typically bigger projects. In this case, you know, we just have a simple script uh, and an and self -enca encapsulated script, so we can just use JBang to interpret those dependencies, and we don't need to use anything else. So in this case, you can see we're using uh, Pico CLI which is uh, a way to use uh, CLI uh, to build CLI scripts with Java pretty easily. So you can see here, if you're not familiar with uh, Pico CLI, you can see you know, it has a couple uh, at, um, annotations. And basically, that helps me uh, add parameters to my CLI script. So then I can run it uh, exactly like we did our previous one, so CLI.java. And um, well, if we run it like this, um, it'll be hello world. And actually there was a parameter. So we can say uh, our parameter is dev nation. And then we can see hello dev nation. And the cool thing with Pico CLI is too that you can do, you know, like with uh, typical scripts dash H or dash dash help. And then uh, we can see what the script expects in terms of parameters. And that's all kind of built in with that. So very easily and very quickly, we're up and running with, uh, with CLI scripts with Java. Um, and there's kind of, it's a little bit gimmicky, gimmicky, but something that you can also do with JBang. Uh, it's a preview feature, so I have to do dash dash preview uh, in it, and then uh, call this GPT.java because yes, you can use Chat GPT with JBang. So you can say like uh, create a script that returns um, the square square root of square root if I can type, of a given number. And we'll see what that does. So this is going to go uh, out to uh, the GPT API and then is going to create some sort of uh, script with that. So we'll see what it created. And every time this is different, so I don't know exactly what it created. But you can see here it generated uh, something that looks like it might uh, work, right? So uh, that will actually create uh, return to square root. So we can try it. Let's see if it works. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so square root of nine and oh, it's asking for the number, which is also fine. Oh, and it works, right? Square root of nine is three. So, you know, kind of gimmicky, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I wouldn't trust it necessarily uh, blindly. I would definitely look at the code, but it's uh, handy to get started and maybe have some ideas. So. That's uh, that's JBang. That's one of the tools uh, that I think is pretty handy to get started in uh, and to get working with and to create CLI scripts and self-encapsulated Java uh, programs. So I showed you how you use uh, JBang, JBang init with template CLI. 
and I showed you with uh, GPT. So you could also do like, uh, you know, print the cat and it'll print the cat or, you know, create a currency converter or something. So some ideas that you can uh, use uh, JBang with. You do need an open AI um, uh, API key. Um, but other than that, you know, you set that in your environment variables and uh, JBang will take it from there. So uh, that's JBang. Now, you know, when we're developing Java, a lot of times we're uh, working with different versions of Java, right? So maybe uh, we're at our organization and there's still some legacy projects that are using uh, Java 8 and then, you know, some newer projects that are using Java 11 or oh, state-of-the-art Java 17, even though it's been around for, uh, for a few years now. Um, or maybe, you know, you want to experiment with uh, Java 20, the upcoming Java 21, and but you need to switch between these different versions. And then maybe your organization also use like a specific uh, version of OpenJDK provided by, you know, the Adoption program or by uh, uh, an IBM or another vendor or something that have a specific OpenJDK version. So you need to switch to that. And then maybe you're also using GraalVM, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to switch between these projects, which isn't always so easy. So one project that does that, uh, you know, pretty, you know, that makes it a little easier is uh, SDK Man. Uh, so you can use uh, something like SDK List Java. So you install SDK Man, and then you can list, you know, the Java versions that are available through uh, SDK Man, and then you can install a specific version of Java, and then another version, and then you can switch between them by saying SDK use this version or that version. So. Uh, let's look at that real quick. Um, and I need my uh, terminal back, so I'll start it up here. There we go. And um, so I'll go to my workspace, Debo, Dev Nation. And so let's see, SDK list Java, right? And so if we do that, we can see, wow, there's a whole bunch of different uh, Java versions available that I can install through SDK, man. And then, um, so you can do SDK install Java. And then if you do tab tab, then it's going to suggest the different versions that are available to install. And then, you know, as you uh, type a little bit more, so I can, maybe I want to install uh, Java 21 and then uh, I'll tab some more and see, well, these are the versions that are available. So, you know, for example, uh, open JDK. So SDK install, blah, blah, blah. And then this will install Java 21 on my machine, and then it'll ask me if I want to use it or not. Now, I'm just going to skip this so we can save, shave off a, a second or two. But so um, you can also switch different versions of Java. So right now, I think my uh, Java version, Java version. Uh, so right now, I'm running Java 17 uh, Temurin. So by the Adopt Open JDK, the Adoptium uh, op, op, uh, version of Java which is also what's maintained by Red Hat, by the way. And so if I now want to say I want to switch to a different version, I can do SDK, use uh, Java, and then I can tab and see which versions are available on my machine. So I have an 11, I have a 17 Timurin, I have a 17 open, and a 20 open. So if I switch to 20 open, and then uh, now if I do Java version, I can see that you know I'm using Java 20. So I can switch around pretty easily. So with SDK man, so you can do install different versions of Java, but also other JVM based uh, uh, components, such as uh, actually JBang is one that you could install by SDK man. So you can do SDK install JBang, and then again we can see you know all the different versions, which are quite a few of. And so for example, I can install 107, which I've already installed. Um, and then I can install also, you know, the Quark is CLI, for example, so SDK install. And then, you know, this will install the latest version of, uh, of Quark is CLI, which in this case is 3.1.3 final. And then I can set this as my default version. Sure, why not? And so there we go. Now I have the latest version of uh, Quark is installed on my uh, machine. So SDK, man, pretty handy for uh, working with uh, well, different versions of Java and different uh, components, such as also Maven, JBang, Quarkus, and a bunch more. Um, so, you know, definitely take a look at that uh, uh, project. So, now usually with Java, right, you write your code, then you have to compile, then you have to deploy, then you can finally run and test and then repeat, right? Then you have to code, you have to recompile, and that's kind of annoying to have to do that manually every time. So, there's 
a few ways to uh, to make that easier. Um, my favorite way, of course, is uh, using Quarkus and uh, Quarkus Dev Mode. So Quarkus Dev Mode, you start Quarkus and you start uh, Quarkus Dev and or Maven Quarkus Dev or Gradle, and um, it'll start your uh, your application in this kind of Dev Mode where it's constantly checking to see if your changes and it, uh, as you save them, it'll reload. Um, just you know the classes that uh, that you're changing, so you have a very quick uh, feedback loop. So I can show that real quick too. You know we're just going to go through some uh, some demos because why not? That's fun, right? So uh, if I create a new uh, Quarkus project, so I just installed the Quarkus CLI, so that's handy. Quarkus create app and then let's give it a name, DevNation. And so, you know, I could add dependencies and I could change the names and everything, but, you know, this is a very simple example of Quarkus Create App, DevNation. And so, you know, we created this uh, new thing, new application. And so if we go and uh, we can use uh, VS Code, for example, so code DevNation, we start up our project. And so Quarkus, uh, just like that, has created a project for me with, um, a greeting resource, um, which by default is hello from REST Easy Reactive. And so now I'm, I want to start my uh, dev mode. So if I open a terminal and I do quark is dev, then um, you know the dev mode will start and it'll expose this uh, REST endpoint on my local machine. So uh, let's give it a moment to start up. There we go. And so in just a second, we'll see that it's running. There we go. And so if I now go to my browser and I go to localhost 8080 where it's uh, running, we can see that you know our uh, Quarkus application is running. And there's a hello endpoint that uh, shows, and I'll make it a little bigger, hello from REST Easy Reactive. And so if I want to now do my, let's say, development, uh, I'm going to make a big code change, right? Hello from nation and uh, I save it uh, I don't have to recompile or anything I just hit refresh and you know I got my changes so I get a really quick feedback loop which is which is pretty cool if you haven't seen uh, quark is dev mode yet um, so that's uh, that's pretty cool to be able to do that and you can do the same thing uh, with uh, with your tests too so incidentally when you create a new quarkus application, uh, it'll even provide you with a little test. And actually, you can see that it doesn't match, right? So we can start our live testing mode as well by pressing R. You can see it here in the bottom. Um, and so if I hit R, it's going to run my tests. And we'll see that it fails, right? Because we changed it to dev nation. So if I change that to dev nation, and again, I'm not doing anything it automatically reruns my test for me as I'm developing. So I get a very quick feedback loop. And it's not like, you know, I'm making all my code changes, kind of forget about my tests. And then, uh, you know, after a while, I'm doing a Maven package. And then uh, I get all these broken tests because I kind of forgot about it. No, in this case, we're getting a very quick feedback loop. So, you know, as I'm changing my code or as I'm doing my tests, you know, I can immediately get feedback that, hey, uh, your test is broken again because you have this exclamation point. Let's remove it, and then we can see that the tests are passing. So, you know, that's pretty handy with uh, the Quarkus dev mode. So let's go back to our presentation. We're going to move pretty fit, quick, quick here to the next subject, which is uh, test containers. So test containers is a very cool and handy project, um, especially if you work with, uh, you know, kind of dependencies like a database or a, a Kafka or another messaging system or something. <clears throat> And um, you know you're working on your local machine, and then uh, well, then you run your test, and that means uh, if you want to do kind of uh, proper integration tests, that you need to have a database running on on your machine. You need to configure it. You need to maybe even install a Kafka uh, cluster or something, and that's not so easy to do, right? It's kind of a pain in the butt just to run tests, and then same thing uh, in your CI pipeline. As it runs through tests, it needs to have those dependencies. So test containers is cool because you can define, you know, those dependencies to, uh, you know, have a certain configuration. But they're running in a container, so you can spin up a container as your tests are running, and then at, when your tests are done, it'll tear down the container, so you're not using extra resources. But then on your local machine as well, you don't need to, you know, configure and manually install all these dependencies. So test containers is a really cool project. 
but it gets even cooler, of course, when you use Quarkus. So Quarkus together with test containers um, is even cooler because uh, Quarkus uses test containers not only in the test phase, but it also uses it in the form of dev services as you're developing your code. So um, let's say that I'm starting an application um, and I have a dependency on a database or so, you know, I'm using an application, uh, you know, I'm cloning a, an, a, an existing application that has a dependency on something um, and I don't need to you know, worry about you know, how to install the database or the other uh, component that I need and how to configure it. So um, I have a small project here that, um, that already has um, a database uh, dependency. So I have my Quarkus with DB. And uh, so we'll do code Quarkus with DB. And uh, so in this project, it's very simple still. But in this case, I have you know, a little fruit resource and, and a fruit entity which returns the fruit name and season. Um, you know, if you haven't looked at uh, ORM Panache, it's pretty cool because you can see I'm defining my uh, my uh, fields as public strings uh, and I don't have getters or setters. And actually with uh, Panache, it's gonna, uh, as you build your application, it's gonna change those into private uh, properties and then create getters and setters. So I don't need to worry about that. But anyway, uh, so let's say that I uh, have this project and uh, you know I can show you here, in uh, my Podman desktop, I don't have a database running right now. I don't have any running on my local machine, but clearly this application does have a dependency on a database, right? So if we go look at um, my pom.xml, you can see you know, that uh, somewhere in here, uh, here we go, there's a JDBC Postgres uh, um, uh, dependency uh, that this application uses. So when I started up, it's going to look for a Postgres database. So again, I'm going to start in that uh, in that dev mode, and when we start it up, we can see that uh, it's going to look for a database and doesn't find it. And then so it says database uh, starting in a container um, for you. So it automatically figures out that hey, you don't have a database, so I'll start one up for you. So now I look at my Podman desktop and we can see, hey, cool, there is a database Docker IO library Postgres and you can see the test containers component that's running with it. Uh, so Quarkus Dev Services uses test containers to start up this container. And so if we go look at uh, our uh, application here, we can see that there's a fruit endpoint and this is coming uh, from the database. So we can see all these different things that are coming straight from the database. Uh, which is pretty handy, right, as you're uh, developing. So if I stop it um, and I go back, I can see that my database is gone, right? So, and of course, if I uh, show you here, if I refresh, of course, there's no application running anymore and definitely no more database. So that's pretty handy for uh, for development. So it works for databases, for Kafka and, uh, and a couple other uh, dev services. So that's uh, Quarkus and Dev Services and test containers. So right now, let's say that I've done some local development, you know, with uh, with those external dependencies. I was developing basically in my inner loop where I'm, you know, doing my development, my testing, debugging, whatever. And then at some point, my code is good enough, I think at least. And then uh, I'll create a pull or a merge request or something. And then uh, we'll go into the outer loop where you know somebody might do a code review. We'll build our application. We'll do some automation, right? Continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment, delivery. Um, maybe we'll do some compliance checks, some security scans and everything. And then eventually we'll go to production. But so in this outer loop, as Java developers, there's actually some gains to be made too to make our life uh, better and uh, you know, not deal with uh, nitty gritty stuff. So of course, you know, these days, the outer loop is containers and cloud and Kubernetes and serverless and all that stuff. So we need to learn a little bit or at least know a little bit about that stuff as uh, Java developers as well. Um, and so, you know, there's some projects out there to work with containers. You know, there's a whole bunch of them. I'm not going to go through them. Um, but again, you can learn one of these specific tools. Some of them are a little easier. Some of them are a little more complicated depending on use cases and everything. Um, but, you know, again, Quarkus makes life easy uh, with that too. So you can do, so for example, Quarkus image build, 
And just you and Quarkus image build will use, if you have Docker or Podman running on your local machine, it'll use that to create a container image. If you want to use a different tool, such as Jib or build packs, that's also kind of uh, supported out of the box uh, with Quarkus. So pretty easy and handy to do. I uh, wrote a little blog post about that that's uh, here in the links too, and I'll share the slides, don't worry, so you can see how to do that. So um, I'll demo it real quick. Um, need to be conscious about my time here. So CD Quarkus with uh, DB, and then uh, we can do Quarkus image build. And just by doing that, um, I didn't really need to do anything else. Uh, it'll build a container for me. And it looks like I have some dependencies because I switched to a newer version of Quarkus that it's going to download. So we'll give that uh, just a moment to, uh, to finish up. And in the meantime, I'm going to close my uh, other window here. There we go. And this one as well. And so, OK, uh, I built my container image. Now, I did have in my application properties uh, a few values. So by default, it'll still build your container, but it'll use you know local host and, and your computer name uh, for the container path. Uh, in my case, I added a few um, values in my uh, application properties to say, hey, I want to create this for, uh, for Quay.io with uh, the image group Kevin Dubois. So it's all ready to actually be pushed to, uh, to Quay. Um, so I could do that. So I can do Quarkus image push. And actually, I could have done that with also build. And then it would build the application, build the container image, and push it all in one go. So but in this case, I've already built the container image. Oops. Quarkus in my. And I probably need to log in to Quay. So uh, it'll fail because I'm not logged in, and I'm too lazy to do it right now. Uh, but this would push my container image automatically to uh, to a registry. And then um, you can add uh, a dependency for, for example, Kubernetes. So uh, if we go back to our slides here, so we created our application, we created our container image, and now we need to deploy it somewhere, right? So um, well, these days, a lot of times, that's to some Kubernetes. And so Kubernetes means that we need to be experts of YAML, right? <laughs> uh, well, ideally not, So um, because this is a lot, right? So this is a, like a very simple deployment that you do in Kubernetes. You need to write all this uh, stuff. And then you have a deployment here. And then you have to have a service. And then you need to expose it with, uh, with a route or with uh, an ingress or something. Um, so you know that's too much for for uh, you know to to do by hand, right? So again, kind of handy that uh, Quarkus has capabilities to make our life easier with that as well. Um, so uh, you just basically for Kubernetes, for example, you Quarkus extension add Kubernetes. So in Quarkus, you can add extensions to you know um, add capabilities to your application. And so you can do Quarkus extension add Kubernetes, and then you can do Quarkus deploy to deploy it to a Kubernetes that you're logged into. Um, so let's let's try it, right? So Quarkus uh, extension add Kubernetes, and I think in this case it probably already is added. And so um, what's cool about that is, um, and let's uh, go back to my VS Code. It's a little bit easier to show it here. So when you build your application, it'll create a Kubernetes folder in your target with a Kubernetes YAML, which has a service and has a deployment to deploy it uh, to uh, Kubernetes. So it creates that for you. Um, so that's pretty handy. So you can do quark is deploy. And I may need to log into my cluster. Let's see what happens here. And so what I've done here, um, I have this developer sandbox. So if you go to developers.redhat.com, you go to uh, developer sandbox, explore the free developer sandbox. Um, uh, you just create a free account if you're not logged in yet. And then you can start a free uh, Kubernetes OpenShift sandbox, so a, you know, a place where you can deploy your application and expose them, and you can even share them. Uh, it's a temporary. Uh, I think it's 30 days, but then you can redo it or whatever. Um, so in this case, I have a new uh, OpenShift sandbox. And you know, so I want to deploy my application to it. So what I can do is I can log into it. Um, and uh, so 
So I'll generate a temporary token. And my internet is a little slow right now. That's always fun. And so now I have a token, which is temporary. Oops. So now if I log in, uh, OC or kubectl, OC login. Oops, I was already part of the command. OK, so now I'm logged in to my uh, sandbox. And so let's see. Actually, it did uh, push to a different Kubernetes. That's, <laughs> that's fine, too. But we're going to push it to uh, to our sandbox. So, because I logged in to this uh, OpenShift sandbox, right, with that uh, with that token login, and so in just a moment we're gonna see. Okay, it's pushed, and so if we go to our app, our uh, OpenShift sandbox, we can see that our Quarkus with DB was deployed. But of course, um, we're gonna see that we have some issues, right, because it has a dependency on a database. So we need to quickly add one. Uh, database, Postgres, instantiate, and then uh, I think I have Quarkus as a username. And so if we create that, we'll create a database that our application can use. So it's already configured to use that. So in just a moment, we'll see that everything is up and running. Now, the problem is that in this case, I started up my application. It seemed like it was up and running, but it wasn't, right, because it was erroring out. So what we would need to do is to need to add uh, health endpoints to our application. Um, so that's something that you can do as well. Um, so uh, MicroProfile is a very handy project, uh, which is a spec, a specification to define how to do cloud native kind of add cloud native uh, dependencies. Uh, capabilities to your application, such as exposing health points, fault, fault tolerance, um, how to call another uh, REST uh, application from your application in a standardized way. And so, you know, different implementations exist. Uh, Quarkus uses MicroProfile, for example. There's other uh, frameworks that use it too. And so that's how you can add health endpoints to your application. Um, I'm going to skip uh, the demo of this because we're running a little bit uh, late. Um, but so let's say that our application is now running um, on our Kubernetes instance, right, on our OpenShift sandbox. And so we're done, right? I mean, this running, no problem. Of course, it continues, right? Because we need to monitor, we need to see how is our application performing and everything. Um, if there are issues, you know, say a user is having some issues, we need to have some way to trace, you know, exactly how their request went, what, uh, what was happening. And so we need to basically add observability to our project. Um, and so a project that uh, helps with that is Open Telemetry. So Open Telemetry allows you and helps you to do uh, to add tracing to your uh, application. Um, and then there's another project which is mic uh, Micrometer, or some people call it Micrometer, um, that adds metrics uh, out of the box. To your application, so you can profile and see, you know, how long do did requests take for this application? Um, what is the garbage collector doing uh, in terms of performance and everything? So it generates a whole bunch of uh, metrics. So I have a little application here where I've already uh, configured that. So let's uh, let's go take a look at that. And so CD blah blah blah, and we can see here Quarkus observability, and these are available on my GitHub as well, so you can find them there. I'll share the link afterwards so we can go to Quark. Um, let's open it with Quarkus observability. And um, we can see in this case, I've added a few extensions. So I've added an open telemetry extension. So you can see it here. Um, and then uh, open telemetry JDBC. So it ties in with my uh, database. And then I also added an extension on micrometer. So these extensions, you can add them very easily to Quarkus. So I already showed you I can use Quarkus extension add. You can also, for example, use your uh, IDE. So there's Quarkus plugins for, for those. So you can add an extension. And then, um, you know, so you have a whole bunch of them. So you can search for, let's say, open telemetry. And then you can just uh, add them this way too. And, you know, if you click on it, then it'll add it. And of course, in my case, it'll say, well, you already have it installed. Kevin, come on, focus. <laughs> All right. So uh, 
Um, so we can run this application on our local machine. And what I'm going to do is, and this is uh, in the source code of uh, the application as well, there's a small Docker Compose file to start up a uh, Jaeger tracing, uh, which is going to allow me to actually see the traces that I'm going to be producing with my uh, open telemetry um, components here. So I'm going to start that up. So again, in Podman Desktop, this is very easy to do. So you see Jaeger all in one is already there. Hit the play button. And that's gonna, you know, start up this container with uh, with that dependency. And then, so now if I run uh, Quarkus Dev, hopefully it'll start up my application, which uh, is very similar to the other one. Expose the fruit endpoint. I think it may have just a couple of fruits instead of the the more the more fruits that the other one was uh, was showing. And um, we'll go and see. Oh, it's starting up my database in a container, right? Because I don't have a, a Postgres running on my local machine. And now it's up and running. So if I go to uh, my local host, so here we can see, by the way, that everything is running properly in OpenShift. Uh, but I'm going to close that. I'm going to go back to my local development. So we have a fruit endpoint once more. In this case, just a banana and an orange. And I'm going to hit refresh a couple times. And so that generated some metrics and some traces. So this is the, the Jaeger component that I started up with the with Docker Compose, I'm going to refresh this, and we can see that it's running on my local machine now. Make it a little smaller, and we have my demo app service. And so now we can go look and find the traces. So I, I guess I've hit uh, refresh 11 times, and we can see, you know, the latest request here was a few seconds ago, and we can expand this to see exactly, you know, which components were being used uh, as I uh, called my application. So we can see which services were called. And in this case, because I also added the JDBC uh, uh, open telemetry, I can even see that uh, you know, like what in my database was hit with which uh, tables, and even you know, I can even expose my select statement and, and everything. So you know, that helps a lot with you know having visibility of your application. And then um, you have also the, uh, the dev mode of oh, uh, the. Um, Dev UI in Quarkus, so you can see kind of what components you have in your Quarkus application. Let's make this a little brighter. And then uh, here we can also see that we've generating micrometer uh, metrics. And so, you know, these are all the different metrics that my application was producing. This is, of course, now right now on my local machine, but this could be consumed by uh, something that collects metrics such as a Prometheus or something to give us feedback on, uh, on what's going on in our application. So let's go back to uh, our slide. So uh, wrapping it up, um, we went through a whole bunch of uh, different components. It was very quick. Uh, let me know uh, if anything interests you. Uh, follow me. I'll, uh, I typically uh, post about different things that I find, you know, interesting tools and whatever more. This session had, you know, kind of a focus also on Quarkus because it does really help a lot. But you know, you can use any of these components with uh, Spring Boot with uh, other stacks too. So, you know, but it does make it a lot easier if you use it with Quarkus. Um, but again, you don't have to. So we used, uh, we looked at SDK man, we saw a little bit of the OpenShift sandbox. Uh, you're definitely welcome to use that. It's free, it's uh, it's out there. Um, we looked at JBang to create those scripts. We looked at OpenTelemetry. Uh, we used Podman Desktop uh, to uh, use containers on our local machine. We looked at MicroProfile. We did not look at JReleaser today. Uh, that's another really cool project if you're creating uh, distributed applications. So you can create new releases and then uh, notify uh, on different channels. You can create, you know, package the uh, uh, release in different ways and uh, create checksums and everything. A really cool project. Definitely check that out as well. Um, the sandbox here, you know, so we'll, uh, we'll definitely post it in the chat, um, but uh, it's very simple. Developers.redhat.com and then you'll find it. Uh, right there, so you can start uh, playing around with uh, with OpenShift. Um, my colleagues, and I think I saw Natalia in the in the chat. He's one of the authors of this cool book, Marcus uh, Eisel, as well, about modernizing <clears throat> enterprise Java applications and kind of uh, migrating from, uh, you know, let's say, a legacy application to an application that uses, for example, uh, Quarkus. So there's a free download for uh, for that book, uh, also on developers.redhat.com, by the way. Um, and we actually have a bunch more books, so uh, you know, definitely take a look at that. I'll uh, share the slides. Here they are, actually, so I can uh, put that link in there. 
And uh, that's it. So, uh, you know, here's some ways that you can connect with me. Uh, reach out if you have any questions, uh, and I'll be on the, on the Slack as well. And uh, if you want to post anything here in the chat, I'll uh, try to answer that as well. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, it was a great presentation. I even learned a couple of things. I, I'm actually looking forward to use that uh, VM uh, juggle tool because I've been always messing around with those. So much yeah, appreciated. Perfect. Um, I hope the, the audience also got some valuable insights. I suppose so. Um, as a reminder, this session will be made available on the Reddit Developer YouTube channel. So uh, definitely watch it again and share it with friends if they um, need some help with shortening the non-fun things of their lives and actually focus on the developer things they need to do. Next up is a presentation around building modern microservices at scale with DataGrid and Quarkus. So if you uh, want to join that, please stay around. Uh, there's another four minutes into the break. Uh, if not, you can hop over to one of the other sessions like building sentiment analysis with Kafka and AIML, or on the other stage is the fine-grained API authorization using three skill and the authorization system. For now, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you in the next one.